So here it is, episode 11 of Media Dodger, where I talk about the Tower of Druaga. I first heard of this game on Namco Museum DS. That was how I first exposed myself to it. And ever since, like, I when I first played the game, I couldn't really get that far in it because I was, like, getting stumped. It was really, it really was a hard game. But then eventually I things were getting serious uh, and I really actually wanted to actually beat the game, you know? And I did. I, I After I beat it, I actually beat it a few more times. And, yeah, it was like, it was like a thing to me. Like, I would play the game quite a disturbing amount of times, even though I didn't really enjoy the game that much. And that was part of what inspired this episode. When I play Tower Draga again on the Switch compilation of Namco Museum, I play it a few more times. And then the idea came to me. If I don't enjoy the game, why do I even play it? That's the question I would even ask myself, my younger self, when he was playing the game on the DS. So that was part of the idea of what I did for the script. It's like solving the mystery of my continuous playthroughs of the game, despite not having much enjoyment in it. And for this idea, I needed not just the Dodger on screen, I needed another character. So basically, what I had was a wizard character that's going to appear on the screen in just a minute. Uh, the wizard was... Uh, the costume was very easy to put together. I was only dressed in my high school graduation robe with a wizard hat and a fake beard. Oh, here's that flashing effect. Very basic little flashing effects, and I mean basic. Now, for the wizard's voice, I originally wanted... For someone else to have a voiceover that syncs up with the wizard's dialogue. Kind of like what they did with Darth Vader. How they would have someone in the costume and then someone doing the voice. Like, you know, they had David Prowse in the costume, James Earl Jones doing the voice. It was something like that. I first tried it with Aaron M.T. because I thought he did a pretty good, he would do a pretty good old man voice. Because that's what I imagine this wizard being, you know, like an old man, as you can tell by the beard but uh he only was only able to do like the first line pretty good and he gave up after that because the rest of the lines were a bit difficult then i turned to yak pw yeah yak it's yak because is it's spelled jack but it's yak he's swedish anyway i asked him because i knew he was like the fantasy type he was a huge fantasy fan I thought he could do a good job with the voice. But then eventually, late in the editing, I decided, you know, I, I'm not going to wait all day. Or all. I'm not going to wait too long for to receive the results. I'm just going to have my voice be the voice of the wizard. And I'll just add a reverb effect in post. So it would sound different. And for... The wizard on screen, the first shot on the TV, I had pre-recorded footage of me in my room in the wizard costume saying my lines. And then I had that same footage played on the TV as an unlisted video on YouTube. Because that was how I was originally going to have the voices done. But yeah, very basic uh, little effects there. And so now here I am playing the game, and uh, yeah, this is like your first impression of the game. Gilgamesh, the player character, moves incredibly slow. That's how you start the game. You have such a slow movement speed, which becomes a problem because of the time limit and the wisps that spawn when it gets to the 60 second clock. Ah, uh, man, that's... Uh, what a way to start the game. Just be incredibly slow moving. Uh, but thank goodness for treasures that you can pick up. That can really be a big help. But there's like all sorts of conditions for the treasures. 
all sorts of crazy conditions that you would never really be able to figure out without any kind of guide. So the game is not that well designed when it comes to hold when it comes to the treasures you need to pick up. It is a uh, It was popular in Japan because of the critical thinking that is required, but for us American gamers, we just called it cryptic. It was a uh, far too much on us we can't really we couldn't really think that far outside the box so it really inspired the idea so it's a good thing this game really inspired the idea of guidebooks and and sharing game tips so so it can make things a bit easier and the home versions at least the later ones have these hints to help you get the items you need and this is especially important if you want to collect the items that you need in order to beat the game. And, and yeah, be sure to get the pickaxes and try not to break them. And sword controls are certainly different if you played other action-adventure RPG-style games like The Legend of Zelda. It's very different, the fact that you have to hold down the button to keep the sword pointed in front of you. And then hold, let go of the button to put the sword away. And it's uh, here I am talking about the enemies that you fight. You gotta like draw your sword and walk into the slimes. Make sure they're not walking straight into you. And that's pretty interesting. The fact that they can still kill you even if you've got your sword drawn. If they're moving towards you. Uh, and then there's the fact you don't have an energy meter on screen. The energy meter does exist, you just don't see it. And yeah, later on there would be uh, other ways in which you could take more than one hit before losing a life. And that's pretty interesting, that fact that this is one of the earliest video games to use an energy meter, but you don't even see it on screen. And the energy meter only goes down when you're fighting certain enemies. And everything else just kills you instantly. So I'm not really sure how helpful the energy meter really an energy meter really would be if it was displayed on screen. And the fact that you have to kill a specific enemy in order to get the chest. Like with the blue knights, there's two blue knights. And then there's another floor where there's two mirror knights. Only one of them reveals the chest. If you kill one that doesn't reveal the chest, you got to kill the other one. Which is uh, <laughs> pretty silly, but whatever. Oh, and then there's the magicians. <laughs> oh, those mages. I really was annoyed by the mages. They shoot spells. That, like, And not only was I annoyed, it, they stress me the heck out. It's even now I get stressed at the mages from the for the spells that they fire. <sighs> well, I still haven't really been able to get over it because I have no idea when and where they're gonna appear. Because like they could just spawn like right in front of you when you least expect it, and. There's like the different kinds. The ones that shoot through the walls, I think those are the worst ones. Because, you know, why would it? Why would they not be the worst ones? Yeah. And it's especially annoying when you get two mages appearing at once, firing spells at you. Like, in, at the, in the same direction. They're both going towards you. You like kill one, but then because your sword was drawn, the spell from the wizard behind the one you killed ends up killing you with the spell, and you're and you're never gonna be ready for it. That's that's the number one anxiety I get from playing the game, like watching out for the mages. How am I supposed to watch out for the mages if they don't have any sort of predictable pattern? 
And here I am making a little Pac-Man Fever reference, changing Pac-Man Fever to Tower of Druaga Fever. That's basically what I had when I first played this game, because I was playing it a bit too much, because it's it's a crappy game, and I just kept playing it. Yeah, there's the weird conditions, like make a druid appear on the bottom row. That is a weird condition. Like, how do you make a druid appear on the bottom row? And the uh, floor 19 has uh, all these wizards, which is really annoying. And this is a treasure you need, the Book of Light. It lights up the floors from floor 20 to 23. And you're going to need that. Uh, you don't need me to tell you that you're going to need that chest. And if, and yeah, I broke the, I actually broke the pickaxe on the previous floor here, and it really created a problem there. There's my star position, there's the key, there's the door, and the only way to get back to the, to the starting position, and after you've passed the door, is through the door. Like, how am I supposed to collect the key, then get back to the start position, and, uh, how am I supposed to get the key, unlock, open the door, then get back to the start position without leaving the floor? <laughs> like, that is frustrating, isn't it? That's very frustrating. And here I am uh, on floor 18. Yeah, I'm going back. Yeah, this was the hardest episode for me to edit because it never follows a linear order of gameplay. And I have to, like, keep switching back and forth. And I knew it was going to be a difficult project as I was playing the game. I knew I wasn't going to have be re reviewing the game in order. So I was changing up the order of what the footage I was showing in the game. And it, thankfully to help me out, I had written a little timeline on a document. Like a timeline of all the events that occur. Like noteworthy events and that helped out with the editing but it was still a very long tedious process to get everything done and yeah i talked mostly about the treasures in this movie and i knew the audience would get bored at me talking about mainly the treasures you would get in the game so i tried to talk about the music and see if i can find anything noteworthy there but uh, I didn't really have much luck I tried talking about the music that it was a very short soundtrack like only four different stage themes as well as a congratulatory uh, track for when you beat the game and for the name entry and that's that's about it that's all the tracks there is in the game it's not a very big soundtrack And yeah, I'm talking about the balances, talk about how that would have gotten you the evil gauntlet if you didn't pick up the balance. <laughs> yeah, you're going to need to pick up all the balances so you can get all the good items. Now, floor 45, this one has two chests. Now, that's interesting. This floor has two different chests and you're gonna need to pick them up in a specific order there's one that shows up right away but you can't pick that up yet or else you won't be able to get the sword you need so first you gotta satisfy the condition by killing the knights in the correct order so it's lizard man hyper knight mirror knight black knight blue knight and yeah here's me trying to get the red knight and the lizard man to separate yeah the red knight is not part of the equation you shouldn't try to kill him because he is very powerful. He's very strong. Not really powerful, just very strong. And it's going to be a real pain trying to kill the Red Knight, so don't even try. So here I am taking the chests in the correct order so I can get Excalibur. And then here's the Hyper Armor. The Hyper Armor, it seemed like a sweet deal when I first got the Hyper Armor. And the fact that I can just use the armor itself 
to disable one spell per floor. And it actually created more of a problem than, and then I actually knew when I first played the game and got to floor 59. Like, when I first got the hyper armor, like, it was sweet deal. But I got to floor 59. The first enemy I was required to kill on floor 59 was the fastest hyper knight. But he just kept killing me instantly, and I never knew why. It was getting really aggravating at the fact that the first enemy I needed to kill on this floor just kept killing me over and over and over again, even though I was just running at him with my sword drawn. Then I figured out on the internet that it was because the hyper armor, if you disable a spell with the hyper armor, it reduces your overall energy down to 1 HP. But that was not something the game hint told you about. Don't you think that would be a helpful hint? Like, basically, the hint should say the, the hyper armor absorbs one spell per floor, but upon absorb absorbing a spell, well, your HP reduces to one. That's, uh, that's why, I have no idea why the game hint never told us about that. Did it just want to prey on unsuspecting gamers and just leave them frustrating and not knowing why they're so frustrated at it? <sighs> that's, that's how I started to feel when I found out what the problem was. I was just getting really aggravated. I was thinking maybe it was some kind of glitch or something, like... I don't know, either it was a glitch or it just has like, the Hyper Knight is a really weird enemy that behaves in, in a much different fashion than any of the other knights in the game. <laughs> it was, uh, yeah, it was really aggravating, but once I figured it out, it was even more aggravating that the game would tease me like that, like I was saying in the video. <sighs> And floor 59, in general, is a very difficult floor. It gives you so much you need to do. First, you should kill the two mage wizards. I, st I stand by that. The two wizards you kill, it doesn't, you don't, you're not required to do so, but you should. You know, just to avoid the risk of absorbing a spell with a hyper armor. Because if you absorb a spell with a hyper armor on floor 59, you're pretty much just dead. Like, you have no chance. And so you kill the fastest Hyper Knight, you kill the true one out of four more wizards that appear. Then you kill the dragon, which should be easy if you've got the Hyper Mace. And then you fight Draga. And Draga is probably the toughest final boss. One of the toughest final bosses in video game history especially considering how the game is played. But with patience and perseverance, you beat Draga, and then you go to floor 60, you do everything that's required, you rescue Key, and you place the blue crystal rod, and that's the game. So here's a little victory fanfare right there. And the congratulations screen. <laughs> uh, <laughs> congratulations. Maybe it's supposed to be like that sort of stereotype with where Asians can't say the L. Kind of a crude stereotype, but still, like, there's the typo. And, yeah, overall, pretty crappy game. But it made for an interesting little episode. It was like a sort of journey I was taking on to solve the mystery of why I keep playing it. And I soon realized that I do indeed enjoy the game by the time the wizard gives his second and last scene in this episode. I thought it was an... In I, I figured I would just end this episode on a little cliffhanger when I drive off like that because I wanted that to segue... And when I got the idea for me to get in the car to talk to the wizard one more time, I had the idea, like, hey, I, I, I already had the idea of another episode, like the next episode I had in mind, 
and I already did the shooting for the episode. Yeah, I did the shooting. I didn't even write a script for it. But anyway, you'll see the episode soon. Here I am talking to the wizard again once more with the reverb effect going. How, why do I expose myself to entertainment I don't find particularly fun? It's <laughs> it's kind of a deep thing. Like, yeah, actually, I actually have a sort of passion for the game. I may not think of it as poorly designed, but really, it just hasn't aged well. It wasn't really the game's fault or anyone else's. It's just that the game doesn't really hold up as well as other games that we have defined as the standard. Games like Legend of Zelda are better examples. They're just better done. It's just that the Tower of Draga laid down some foundations of how future games would be created. It's just that those future games spiced up and improved what Tower of Draga has done. It, it, yeah, Legend of Zelda is essentially just a better version of the Tower of Draga, except it's on a console instead of in the arcade. Yeah, and I guess those... It, and it also really establishes that these role-playing type of games are better suited for consoles than the arcade. That's just the way I see it. Now, I myself am not a big fan of RPGs. I'm more of an action-adventure type of gamer. But yeah, it is interesting to see how Tower Draga has allowed for better games in the same genre. And here's how the, I originally had shot a scene of me driving away in the car. Like it was going like down the street and it was driving away from the camera. But I, just, but I left that out because it showed my license plate number. Um, privacy reasons, you know. But yeah, that's all I really have to say about this episode. I had a good time shooting this episode editing it was a different story but yeah still a great episode i think <sighs> that's all the commentary bye